but you can hardly tell that. I think we claim him already as a Prince Georgian because he has given us his very best as well. And so I want to thank him and all of the men and women of the uh, Prince George's County Police Department who do a, a, a just a heroic job uh, in terms of keeping us safe, uh, as well as the new members of our Violence Prevention Task Force. I want to thank them also for joining the team. I tell you, we are indomitable right now. We have a strong team uh, that we're putting together. Uh, I also want to thank two of my really great friends. Uh, one has been a friend for a very long time, and every time I call him, I have worried this man to death. Uh, it was If it was the state's attorney's office, he showed up for us. He's shown up for us over and over again here as I've been county executive, and that is Reverend Tony Lee uh, from the community of Hope AME Church. And so I want to thank him so much for being here. Uh, Barry Stanton, who is our chief uh, deputy chief administrative officer uh, for public safety, want to thank him. Uh, likewise, he's been here months long back in this position, but he's done a beautiful job. So I want to thank him also for his leadership, as well as my good friend, and she's in the back. We're in her beautiful uh, venue here today, and I think it's just gorgeous. And so I want to thank Brooke Kidd from Creative Suitland and Joe's Movement Emporium. Uh, Brooke has also been on the front lines uh, for, for really a very, very long time. Uh, working with our young people, and I want to thank her also for uh, opening up today and for being a wonderful part uh, of our efforts today. Now, I want to cover our Hope in Action project, uh, provide details on the Hope Collective, as well as congratulate the members of the Violence Prevention Task Force. Uh, afterwards, I will hand things over to Reverend Lee and Police Chief Aziz, who will give you additional updates um, regarding the work that we are preparing to do. Um, but first, I have an urgent plea, and I want to make this plea for all the parents of Prince Georgians, uh, of our children in Prince George's County, and I say so as a parent of a teenager. And so I, I recognize what is required in this moment. I'm going to ask all the parents of children, the children of Prince George's County, to do me a personal favor and sit down with your children. Put them at a table. If, you, if you're like me, I get all of the tea that I need in the car with my daughter. She doesn't even recognize uh, what we're doing. We get in the car to ride. I hear everything I need to know about my daughter, about what concerns her, about what her thoughts are on various issues. And so I'm asking the parents of Prince George's County's children to please, ma'am, please, sir, do me a favor. The family members, sit these kids down and ask them what is going on. Don't miss the chance to, uh, to connect with your child and ask them what they're seeing, what they feel, what their hopes are, what their concerns are, what their fears are. Find out whether there is something that we can do more as a community that we have not done to address the concerns that they have. Ask them what is going on, whether they're scared or stressed out. Ask why, why they believe what we're seeing is happening. And I believe that we'll get some solutions that we have not yet heard. It is important to talk to our children. We need to come together to better understand what is going on with the children of our community. And when we ask, I want us to also do, do me a favor and listen. Listen. Please, let's listen to our children. We want to reverse what we see as a troubling t trend. Uh, it's an uptick that we've seen in violence, but I, I know as well as everybody gathered in this room that the government cannot flip a switch and make it happen. So for anyone who's under any illusion that somehow the government can cure this, I want to just disavow you of that thought right now. This can't be solved just by the government. We're here and we're going to put the full force of the government behind this issue, but I recognize without parents and family members and community leaders, there is very little that we can do to turn this around without them. And so, again, speaking as a parent, let's get to our children. Let's get back to where we were. Let's sit at the table, do whatever you have to do, ride in the car. I even walked around the neighborhood when my daughter didn't recognize was going, would you like to take a walk <laughs> with me? And I got all in her business during the walk. <laughs> and I'm going to urge all of these parents to do the same thing. We have got to get into our children's business. It is critical. Now, reducing violent crime will require us all to work together. And again, while government cannot do it alone, we are taking every possible step forward to solve the issue, to protect our residents, and to protect our community. And our county is responding to this rise in violent crime through a coordinated effort across government, one that enlists local nonprofits to help stem the tide of violence 
while also working with the police department on effective solutions to track, deter, and solve violent crimes. Today, I wanna talk about our work to stop violent crimes before they start. One important step that we're taking to meet this goal is the Hope in Action Anti-Violence Project. And again, I wanna thank Pastor Lee uh, for bringing us this uh, project. Uh, this is something that he uh, wanted us to replicate. He first noticed it, that it was having some uh, success in California and brought it here. And uh, we launched in late October this program here, and it helps us to uh, prevent violent crime through a focus on interrupting cycles of violence with targeted care. The program uses four strategies to reduce gun violence. We're working with peacekeepers to prevent violence before it can start. Uh, we're, work we're also using a strategy which combines diversion and reentry services, which offers first time and recurring non adjudicated youth offenders assistance with the state's attorney's office. Uh, that's through the existing Urban Youth Pretrial Diversion Academy. We're using community and school based wraparound services as well to offer after school enrichment programs, assistance with food insecurity, <coughs> case management services, and access to in school peer support groups. And our fourth strategy is the Violence Prevention Task Force. And today I'm proud to announce that we have appointed 20 individuals to the Violence Prevention Task Force. Uh, each of them comes from across Prince George's County, uh, which helps this task force have an inclusive perspective. Our Violence Prevention Task Force members come from all walks of life as well, ranging from community activists, there are teachers, veterans, and even parents of gun violence victims uh, who are a part of this task force. This group will meet and identify areas of critical need where we need more resources and we'll work on a plan to ensure that we get resources into the most critical parts of our community. They will also work to develop short and long-term strategies to reduce violence in our communities. I'm looking forward to all of the ideas and recommendations that this outstanding group of community representatives will put together and I believe that their work will create innovative solutions and strategies uh, to help us effectively combat violent crime in our community. In addition to the work of our Violence Prevention Task Force, we are also proud to partner with a group of nonprofits in our community who work to address <coughs> issues like health care access, poverty, housing, and a number of other urgent problems that our residents uh, face. The county is providing grant funding to a group of nonprofit partners that we are calling the Hope Collective. Together, these nonprofit entities, entities will help us provide targeted wraparound services into communities that need them most. I'm honored to work with these 16 grantee organizations on solutions that help our residents and provide a path away from violence for our young people. This grant program represents a critical component of our Hope in Action anti-violence project. And with these grant funds, our Hope Collective will be able to expand the reach of their work maximizing their impact. Centro de Apoyo Familiar will be able to provide essential services and resources related to food, housing, health care, and jobs. The Training Source, Inc., will help provide further job readiness, uh, job training, job placement, uh, assistance for young people. Jacob's Ladder will have the funding they need to continue providing juvenile reentry services, diversion services, and other programs which enrich the lives of our teens. And Joe's Movement Emporium, whose space we're in today, uh, will expand their Create Teens program that aims to address mental health issues among teenagers, creating a safe space for developing social and creative skills. This is just a small sample of the projects that these amazing 16 nonprofits will be able to execute now that they have received the grant funding. T together, this Hope Collective will help create a brighter future for our community. Overall, we're trying to think about how our anti-violence campaign broadly, uh, we wanna make sure we're imagining ways that we can help create positive outcomes for our youth and adults alike who are at risk of committing violent crimes. If you didn't see this past uh, week, we had our Youth Engagement Week in Prince George's County and the programs that we launched and highlighted are meant to have a positive impact on our community. Over the course of the week, we focused on all of the opportunities that Prince George's County has for children to grow and thrive, like the Cabinet for Children and Youth, uh, which we announced at the beginning of last week. 
This newly formed cabinet will work to address and respond to issues facing our children's youth who are 25 years old or younger. And this cabinet will issue a preliminary report with recommendations for improving coordination of services across different levels of government and community-based organizations. Now, by next December, this cabinet will help us identify ways to coordinate and better provide services for our youth in a way that better serves them and serves our community. In addition to our Children's Cabinet, our Office of Human Rights has launched a Youth Leadership Academy. This academy is designed to engage the minds of our young people, ages 12 to 22. Participants in the program learn about a variety of human and civil rights issues and how they have the power to make a positive change. This program encourages our young people to feel empowered. At any age, we want them to know that they can make a positive difference in our world. And this program goes a long way towards, towards showing our youth how they can help promote human rights. Prince George's County has a long and focused uh, effort as well. Many of you are aware of our Summer Youth Enrichment Program, and this program has allowed us to uh, help our children with every opportunity available so that they might succeed in a changing world. It may be cliche, but we know that our children are the future, and we also know uh, that the most important investment we make is in our kids. And so that's why when I took office, uh, I worked to expand the scope of our Youth at Work Summer Youth Enrichment Program, increasing job opportunities and expanding the age range. In fact, in our first year, we doubled uh, the number, more than doubled the number of children who could participate in our program, employing close to 7,000 children our first summer. And even during the course of the pandemic, that commitment remained in place. And we employed over 4,400 children even during the course of the pandemic. Uh, this summer, we will continue to offer this program for our youth. And I want to take this uh, opportunity as well to remind everybody uh, that the applications for this year's program open tomorrow. So we need you all to let Lottie Dottie and everybody know that the application is, uh, is online tomorrow. They'll start calling me to find out when. Uh, but for our children 14 to 22, they can now apply. And after its successful first summer, even during, again, the midst of the pandemic, we also launched the Also Brooks Summer Passport Experience which will continue to provide our youth with a healthy way to learn, interact, and play this summer as well. Uh, the kids want to go to Six Flags and other places and have uh, midnight basketball, arts, other programming. So these two programs together mean that our youth will always have something constructive to do during the summer months. Uh, and so that leads me basically to our last, to my very last point. And you know what? This one is just honest. I am, like so many other people in our community, I am so frustrated and so concerned about the violence that we are seeing. I just am. I don't know how else to say it. I, I am just so um, upset about it and concerned about the people in our community who have been victimized. I am likewise concerned about the future of our children. We know that there are two ways we do this. We invest in our young people, and today is to talk once again about the very heavy investments that we are making in our young people to help them heal, to help them grow, to help them thrive, to make sure we're wrapping our arms around them, reminding all of us again that we can't do this without their parents and without their family members. We can't do it. It won't be solved at the police station. It won't be solved at the courthouse. It won't be solved through the government. Children are developed first at home. We recognize that, that the people who have the greatest influence over our children are the people in their sphere. We want everyone to know that the government is right here. We're going to provide, we will spare no resource available to us to make sure that we're investing in our young people. And as I pass it off to our police chief, I also want the people of this community to know that I take their safety and their freedom to heart. That likewise, just as, as our children have a right to be free and to thrive, so do, so do their parents and grandparents and aunts and all of the rest of us have a right to live in a place that is free. So I do want to be abundantly clear that we're making the investment now and we know that some of our young people have to be held accountable. That's all there is to it, is we're going to provide the resources to heal and we're also urging that our young people must be held accountable, the ones who are committing acts of violence. We're not going to turn a blind eye to it. We got to do both. 
And so that's, that's the other uh, point that you've heard it here today, that that's what this is about. We're going to put everything we have into our young people to heal them and to help them thrive. And for those who are, are d determined to harm, to, to scare, um, and to hurt our community, we also, I'm asking and demanding that they also be held accountable. So I'm going to hold, I'm going to hand this over now uh, to Chief Aziz. And again, thank you so much to all of you. I look forward to the work that we're going to continue doing together. Thank you. First, uh, well, good morning, I should say still, still morning. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking our leader, uh, the venerated county executive, Ms. Angela Also Brooks, the executive leadership team of Prince George's County, and uh, the DCAO, Mr. Stanton, uh, for their leadership, uh, as well as the Office of Community First out of Prince George's County PD, and the Office of Community Relations in our county, as well as our law enforcement uh, partners uh, and personnel. Uh, We've come together to address this very important issue, which we all agree is affecting the very fabric of what makes Prince George's County so great. It's our communities. We are very excited about these initiatives and even more so about what we hope our collaboration with the collective will yield as we work together to provide these services to our community's youth and their families. At the end of the day, it's about diversifying our approach and ensuring we do everything we can, not only to combat crime, but to uplift and empower our children and to unify our community. We're proudly working with Reverend Tony Lee of the Community of Hope AME Church as partners in Hope in Action Anti-Violence Project. In Prince George's County Police, we have a number of initiatives we're undertaking to reach our youth our Youth Roundtable discussion is an event designed to allow our youth to engage in an honest and open conversation with members of the police department and our community leaders. This event will allow youth to ask questions directly about an array of topics, including their interactions with law enforcement, and express the very real concerns that they may have. It's a discussion that seeks to put our youth at the very center of the conversation by offering them re a real seat at the table where they can make their voices heard, and we are listening. Our nationally recognized Police Athletic Activities League will be partnering with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington to provide our youth with more targeted programs and high-yield activities that will enhance and encourage positive youth development. This partnership will focus on three priority outcomes for our youth, academic success, good character and citizenship, and healthy lifestyle choices. We also honored to partner with the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation in the, the breaking ground of our new Ripken baseball field that is located on our property at Landover Division Three Patrol Station in Palmer Park. It is the first of its kind and is located at a police facility in the country, the first of its kind located in a police facility in our country, which is groundbreaking here for Prince George's County. We have crime fighting initiatives in place that are focused upon addressing the rise in violent crime youth offenders, carjackings, and stolen vehicles. And we are committed to working with other partners in this criminal justice system and protecting victims' rights and making sure the best interests in our hearts for our youth and those who may offend. Sometimes this means providing services and oversight, oversight to youth offenders in facilities that provide meaningful outcomes, providing both access and opportunity to our youth and their families, giving access and opportunities to youth uh, and their families. Our past initiatives, like Operation Resolution, which is a winter crime initiative in Prince George's County, resulted in a 30% crime reduction in our six focus areas. Since January 2021, we've taken 1,650 weapons, guns, off our streets, 1,399 in 2021, alone. We also conducted warrant sweeps as recent as last week, arresting 30 violent crime offenders. And yet we know this isn't enough, that we need a holistic wraparound approach. Our officers are hard at work around the clock fighting crime and engaging and building relationships with our residential and business communities, 
such as Pastor Lee and Hope in Action. And we are all excited about the future and the positive impact that these partnerships will bring. Your Prince George's County Police Department remains a committed ally and partner in this fight against crime, the rebuilding uh, of our youth, and the progressive positive outcomes uh, for the future of Prince George's County. Thank you. Now, I know this is a press conference, but as a pastor, I feel like saying, let the church say amen. amen. <laughs> um, I am the Reverend Tony Lee and, um, and program director right now for the Hope in Action Project. I first want to thank our county executive. Uh, county Executive also, but you have been a faithful partner in this community um, as state's attorney and now as county executive. And I am grateful um, that you did not just come with talking points, but you came with resources. Um, and that is what is so important. We cannot deal with this problem reactively, but proactively. Um, and in order to do it, we need the resources to do it. So I want to thank you, thank your team that has been so excellent. I want to thank our chief, Chief Aziz, um, who um, I met you on your third day in town. Um, on his third day in town, um, he came and we met in this parking lot uh, right here in Suitland and we talked about the issues and the needs of community um, and as we got to know each other, um, we started talking about models. We started talking about models uh, to be able to do some systemic work in community to address violence. And I talked about a model I had seen um, and knew some folks who had run in Oakland, California. Um, I've been doing this kind of work for about, wow, so I'm not going to tell you how long because it's a, a few decades now, um, but it will date myself. Um, but there was a model, an evidence-based model in Oakland that has seen great uh, success. And so we talked about it and he said, hey, Reverend, put together something for me. Let's look at it. And I appreciate you, sir, uh, because you could have come in um, and it's easy um, to just try to um, lock your way up, lock your, lock your way out of this situation. But the reality is you can't arrest our way out of this situation. And so I'm grateful for your perspective. Um, and so therefore the Hope in Action Project was born. Um, it is a faith, a for-profit, non-profit and government collaboration. Um, we're grateful to for-profit team gov. Our brother Costello Wilson, the CEO, is here. Uh, the non-profit dreams work and of course county government. I, I do want to thank Director Yanisha Davis um, of the, the um, Office of Community Relations for her incredible work um, in helping us to walk along this journey. And we have three legs to this stool. We've got three legs to this stool. One leg um, is um, our violence interrupters. Those are people who will be embedded in community. We have been able to utilize information um, from the police department to identify communities where we are seeing the most violence, whether it is being perpetrated or victims. And we want to make sure to be able to really drill down and offer resources and services in those communities. Our violence interrupters are people who will be hired, who are hired um, to embed in communities. They're hired to embed in communities so that they can be able to be our ear to the streets. They can be able to be working with folks so that when um, um, issues are bubbling up, they can help to intervene, help to bring truces, help to bring conflict re resolution. They'll also be in our schools and with our young people and offering services there. And I'm grateful for Ms. Joanna Hardy is the director of our violence interrupters. And so Ms. Hardy was right here in front of us. We're so grateful <laughs> for her as we are hiring and bringing that team on right now. The second leg uh, to this stool um, is our Hope Collective. And we are just, my gosh, so excited about 16 community organizations who are already doing the work. And what our hope was is to develop an ecosystem of people, of organizations that are doing the work that can develop synergies one with another, collaborate one with another, as we target areas and issues uh, to be able to do this work. And we are excited if you, and, and, and you'll be able to see uh, just much of the great work and, um, that these organizations are doing. And so we are excited to bring these organizations together as we together uh, attempt to address the issues in community. And the third leg, to the stool um, that will help it stand up 
is our violent anti-violence task, our violence prevention task force. And these are people uh, from the grassroots to the grass tops. These are people um, from all walks of society in Prince George's County who have a heart to be able uh, to end the violence in the county and in the region, who are taking up their time and their energy uh, to help us to strategize, to organize, and to mobilize. And so we are grateful uh, for them as well. And, and so as I close, I just want to say this. We can do this, but we have to do it together. There's no way that we can do this in our individual silos. There's no way the police department can do it by themselves. There's no way the county executive office can do it by themselves. But we have to come together, government, faith community, business community, nonprofit community, and we can have an impact on our community. I believe it in my heart. Um, I believe it in my soul that we can stem the tide of the violence that is plaguing our communities, but the only way we can do it is what? Together. We have to do this together. And if you do your part and 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 we do our part, our community will be better and lives will be saved and generations will be able to accomplish all that they are called to accomplish because in this season and in this moment, we decided to do it. What? Together. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all. So we will first start by asking on topic, I understand some of you have slightly off topic, on topic questions from members of the media. Brad. On this topic, um, <coughs> with respect to everyone gathered here at Fisher Manor, um, and not meaning to be impersonal, do you have any evidence that these children at any time have blood? Yes. You know, we know what happened. It has to commemorate what doesn't happen, but is there any evidence that occurred? Because I don't think a representative And, and, and so what I would share with you is the model we're using is not just violence interrupters, but I talked about the various prongs or the various legs of the stool. The, the model in Oakland is an evidence-based model that has worked, and it has all of the evaluation, et cetera, to talk about the success they have had in Oakland. It's still going on in Oakland right now. I was just with their team. Um, about a month ago. Um, and so um, we can share with you some of that um, information, some of the evidence, but that is a model um, that has shown success. And I also want to add to what um, Pastor Lee said is to remember that there are multiple prongs to the approach that we are suggesting today. So hope in action is a part of it, but remember there's also the investment we continue to make in the Summer Youth Enrichment Program, there's the Children's Cabinet, uh, there's the plan through the Human uh, Relations Commission. So we, it is multi-pronged. We recognize that this problem is complex and that it requires a complex solution. And so it is what Pastor Tony Lee is bringing, but it is a multi-pronged uh, and it is a funded approach toward addressing the violence. Not just one area, there are multiple, uh, we're using multiple weapons, in other words, um, to address it. But you've stood in this position so many times, you know, <coughs> talking about these various programs, and yet the numbers just keep going up. Well, you know what? We have stood in this place multiple times. We've been successful also. I feel as optimistic as Pastor Tony Lee feels because when I came to office uh, in 2010, we saw crime in a particular place. And Pastor Lee, we joined with, uh, with Barry Stanton at the time. A number of us came together, and we were able to see a 50% reduction in crime over those years. And how did it happen? It happened because we made investments uh, through programs, uh, you know, like the, um, we replicated, um, back on track. <laughs> we, we replicated back on track. I belong here. Remember that we also did teen court. But we also held people accountable. And that's why we know that it is all of those entities that would have to work together at the same time to make sure that we're seeing we did, we started with the expungement fairs. All of those things were things that we did alongside holding the people who couldn't be convinced in that way, holding them accountable. And that's why I said it has to be multiple approaches. Know what are your feelings about the community today and, and 
That's such a great question. And I can tell you, I have learned a lot through my daughter's eyes, um, especially over the last two years. She's close to 17, and so I think she reflects the concerns of this entire generation. Our children are under extreme pressure, and many of them are operating almost under duress. Um, they are concerned about the future. Social media, they have these images and have the pressures in their, literally in their pockets. Unlike when I was 16 or 17, these children have to walk away, walk around um, because of social media and because of the internet. They're exposed to things 24 hours a, a day virtually that concern them. The violence, they're not immune to it. They recognize that it is happening. They are concerned about uh, all that they are seeing around them, and they deal with these pressures 24 hours a day, and this is where they are. Many of them are depressed. Uh, a lot of them suffer from anxiety, and they're seeking ways to cope, and I think social media has also prevented our children from developing the interpersonal skills that we were forced to develop as young people because we had to talk to each other. We had to stand on the playground or stand out in the neighborhood and converse with each other. When you do so through Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever it is they communicate, it, to me, it deprives them of the opportunity to develop the skills that we had to develop uh, in terms of interpersonal skills, in terms of conflict resolution. So all of those things are hampered by social media, and so that's the reason I'm saying we got to get in their face again. I can't talk to my daughter through social media. I have to have her in the car, and I do so every single day. I drive my daughter to school every single day so that I can hear what is going on. If it means I have to get up first thing in the morning to do so, that's what we have to do. It means if you sit down in the evening, find some space, and every parent can't drive their child to school. I get this. But if you sit down some point in the evening or invite them someplace to ride to the store with you, but I am just convinced that when we hear from them, we will better understand what they are suffering and what they're concerned about and come up with better solutions. Okay, we can ask off-topic questions. Is what they would tell us about something that's called fate, or is it fate? Any day they uh, have a little bit of death around us. Brad, you couldn't wait to get into this, could you? <laughs> Always on deck. About the Lyft driver? Uh, and what in what we released uh, so far, uh, first of all, I, you know, when you bring up the Lyft driver, my uh, thoughts and prayers are extended uh, to Abdul uh, Khan and his family uh, for such a tragic and horrific, you know, incident that happened here in Prince George's County. Uh, we do know that it, it emanated uh, from uh, the district uh, and ended uh, uh, in Prince George's County. Uh, and our investigators, uh, you've heard me say this from time to time, Prince George's County and Prince George's County Police Department, you should be uh, very proud of the men and women uh, who are investigators there, that they, they work tirelessly uh, in these efforts to bring justice uh, to victims' families uh, for that victim who is no longer with us. And we're working uh, some, uh, we're doing a, a diligent uh, duty uh, and working some really promising uh, leads right now uh, to bring, bring that uh, investigation uh, to a close and to justice for the family. So right now, other than what we uh, have released, we have some things that we're working on, uh, and uh, we should be able to get those things up here uh, relatively uh, soon. Is that what you're thinking well, I, I wouldn't, right now, I wouldn't say that because we're still under investigations. What we, what we do know is a fair originated in D.C. with uh, some occupants that uh, ended with the death uh, of Mr. Khan in Prince George's County. Uh, the facts surrounding that uh, remains open for us. We're, we're examining, investigating all avenues to what that actually was. Again, we're working those investigative tips. We have some leads. Paul, did you, you said it began in the district. Do you know where in the district it began? Uh, a fare uh, was originated from the district for that driver to make a pickup <laughs> from that from that location. Uh, somebody else in the district. Um, we're pretty sure of that that so something occurred. Well, we don't know all that right now. You know, I, you want it, I think you'll be a good candidate to join Prince George's County PD investigative <laughs> unit. Um, you want to, you want to, we're, you know, well, we're speculating, you know, and so uh, whether we are finding if that was a, a pickup or something occurred in the district or did it occur in Prince George's County, we're, we're working through those things right now. 
MGM. What we do know is uh, some uh, action took place in MGM. Uh, a fire alarm uh, was triggered in some kind of way, uh, whether that was uh, intentionally or not. Uh, and during the fire alarm where people exit uh, r rather rapidly, uh, then someone set off what we are pretty sure of, of fireworks. Uh, and fireworks sound very closely uh, related to gunshots. Uh, and uh, that even created more panic uh, in the attempt to exit the MGM. Uh, and during that course uh, of exiting, uh, then uh, we believe uh, in, in our in preliminary investigations that a theft occurred or thefts occurred inside the MGM at that time. Uh, and so we're working through uh, the information that we've received uh, from MGM and other people who were present uh, at the location. Uh, and so we're, we're, com we're getting close to uh, trying to figure out exactly the sequence of events uh, that took place with the fire alarm, the fireworks, and the subsequent thefts. Mm -hmm. Well, when you put things together, uh, you know, anything, you can make coordination. Uh, so uh, I don't, I don't want to go that far to say it was coordinated because this could have been uh, a series of events that some opportunists uh, uh, decided to take advantage of or it very well could have been the same people who uh, uh, triggered the fire alarm, uh, who set off some fireworks, and then subsequently made some thefts. Uh, we're putting the pieces uh, to that together uh, as we speak. Nothing further. Thank you, everyone.